Okay, let's uh, get started. Uh, well, welcome to this uh, session of the uh, Iberian Studies program at the Europe Center in the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. Um, it's not just a pleasure, it's really an honor to welcome uh, Clara Punsati uh, to give the seminar today. Um, Clara uh, received her PhD in economics from the University of Minnesota. Um, I think that your career and mine basically overlap. You know, while you were in Minnesota, I was at Berkeley. Um, and uh, then her uh, professorial career began uh, at the University, uh, the Autonomous University of Barcelona, Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, uh, where she taught for 12 years before taking up a position as senior researcher at the Institute of Economic Analysis in Barcelona, of which eventually she became a research professor and director in 2006. Um, she stayed there until uh, 2015 when she moved to St. Andrews, Scotland, uh, as professor of economics and finance. Her academic path has been uh, marked not only by these uh, institutions that I just mentioned, but also by numerous visiting positions, uh, for instance, at Georgetown University, at Cambridge University, uh, University of Toronto, uh, UC San Diego, and in other places. Um, but of course, um, she's better known to the public, not uh, as an economist, but uh, uh, actually uh, outside academia. Um, and uh, this popularity, this uh, fame that has accrued to her begins in 2017, uh, the year that she became Minister of Education in the Catalan government, actually just a few months before the referendum on independence uh, that, as you know, was held uh, on October 1st, 2017. Um, and uh, that, uh, that referendum and the declaration of independence that followed on the 27th of the same month had enormous consequences. Had consequences that were, of course, collective, but also personal for, for Clara. Um, as you know, immediately afterwards, uh, the Catalan government was sequestered by the Madrid government, and then uh, the persecution of the Catalan politicians, the Catalan leaders, uh, begin, uh, starting with the uh, president of Catalonia and all of his cabinet, of which Clara was clearly a part, as well as some other members, uh, for instance, deputies in the Catalan parliament, the president of the Catalan parliament herself, uh, and other political figures, some of whom uh, went into exile, um, or many of whom went into exile, some of whom returned and then were subject to uh, prosecution uh, in a very famous uh, trial collective trial um, that took place in Madrid, uh, for which they were uh, sentenced to many, many uh, years uh, in jail. Uh, roughly the average, I think, was around 11 years in jail for having been part of uh, that, uh, that referendum. Um, the Spanish judiciary continued to persecute these people, uh, especially those that remained in exile, such as Clara, with international orders of extradition on initially the accusations of rebellion and sedition, um, and Clara voluntarily um, at some point went to court in Edinburgh. Uh, you know, she presented herself and then was acquitted by a Scottish judge. Um, that was not uh, convincing to the Spanish authorities. And of course the uh, order of extradition was extant. Um, uh, in 2020, and this is an important moment uh, in her life, I think she was elected to the European parliament and although Spain has not dropped the charges against her, uh, they have now been modified, they have been changed uh, uh, because of uh, processes and, and uh, events that have taken place at the European court level, the Court of Justice. Um, she has, um, her situation has been ameliorated and she has been able to travel to Catalonia uh, after being in exile for five years. Even so, uh, despite uh, you know, this amelioration, last March when she crossed the border, she was uh, summarily arrested. She was detained uh, in uh, obvious violation of her immunity as member of the European Parliament. Uh, even so, the, the judge uh, who was responsible for emitting uh, those arrest orders uh, did not dare retain her and was, she was promptly released. Because of her courage, her resilience and uh, her no-nonsense approach to politics, she is actually very popular in Catalonia and also with the Catalan diaspora, um, among whom she enjoys very considerable political capital. 
She's a speaker whose statements are listened to and commented by many, as I'm sure that today's lecture will be. That Catalan referendum on independence, fiercely repressed by Spanish police in actions whose images immediately went viral, transcended the interest of the Catalan and Spanish constituencies. The peaceful democratic Catalan struggle for self-determination became a litmus test for democratic processes in the, uh, in the EU and remains a challenge for the extension of democratic rights to all the citizens of the European Union, regardless of the undemocratic or pseudo-democratic nature of the state of which they are legal subjects. And it is on this challenge that we are about to hear from Clara Punsati. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Professor Rosina, for your very warm introduction. And um, thank you very much to the Europe Center for inviting me. Uh, I know this is not a trivial invitation, as Professor Rosina has uh, described uh, the re my recent whereabouts uh, only, you know, uh, a few weeks ago, I was uh, arrested in Barcelona, and only a year ago, I could not have been here without being arrested at the border. And today, some of my colleagues still cannot uh, go into their home or travel freely through the world. So I thank you all for coming and everybody who's listening through the um, electronic platform so it's it's a real pleasure to be here i have lived in the us uh, different periods of my life uh, and exactly three years ago i was in san diego uh, holding a gaspar de portola visiting fellowship gaspar de portola it's a recurrent name for students in california he was the governor of california and a catalan Colonial stories like that of Portola or San Juniper Serra, another Catalan, are now being revised and reassessed as we revise the colonization, especially for native peoples. 30 years ago, however, these discussions had not even started, and almost nobody knew this guy, that these guys were Catalans. In truth, almost nobody knew I was a Catalan because Almost nobody knew that Catalonia existed. Some people knew about Barcelona, where the 1992 Olympic Games had just been held. And with luck, educated people knew about our great artistic references, such as Dali, Picasso, or Miró. But 30 years ago, when I was asked, where are you from? I faced a minor but morally taxing dilemma. Was I going to offer a long-winded explanation of who I was, trying not to look too much as a lunatic, or should I simply skip the trouble and say, I am from Spain? Things have changed. I hear, for example, that Stanford enjoys a vibrant community of Latin American, Native American students, and that the university is making efforts to honor the memory of the Olohan people on whose ancestral lands this campus is located. Things have changed for me as well. When I am asked where I am from, I answer, I am a Catalan. And many times, not always, but many times, I do not need further explanations. Sometimes I might still be regarded as a lunatic, but this reveals more about the politics of the person who's asking than anything else. Since 2017, Catalonia is on the mental map of educated people across the world. I have also changed in these 30 years. I am no longer a professor struggling to publish papers on game theory, and I am not simply a committed Catalan citizen. I have become a member of the European Parliament and a former Minister of Education of the Catalan government, and as Professor Regina has just explained to you, I have endured six years of exile for helping to organize a referendum of self-determination and for refusing to be caught and sent to jail by Spanish thugs, I mean Spanish judges. 
Over the years, I have spent much energy explaining why the Catalan nation wants and deserves a new state. But self-determination is the job of the people who want to become independent, and we must not try to win over the sympathy and support of others before we Catalans do what must be done to be free. So rather than spending time explaining why Catalonia should be independent, I will address the opposite question. How come Catalonia is not independent? Allow me to start with some background information and some general considerations to contextualize, to contextualize the answer to this question. Catalonia is a country in Western Europe and its citizens are citizens of the European Union. We are a Pyrenean and Mediterranean people, the result of several interwinding of peoples that have been invading one another since the earliest manifestations of human civilization. The Roman Empire left a robust legacy on our identity and our language, Catalan, has existed in its written form at least since the ninth century. It is one of the many languages that stems from Latin. The current official category of Catalans refers to the citizens of the so-called autonomous community in Spain, Catalonia. But there are Catalan speakers in southern France, and there are also Catalan speakers in the autonomous communities of Valencia the and the Balearic Islands, and even in parts of Aragon. Also in Andorra, the tiny country of the Pyrenees that has Catalan as the official language, which explains why you can speak Catalan in the United Nations. There is even a city in Sardinia, Alguero, where they also speak Catalan. So all in all, there are about 40 million people in this territory. That is, Catalan has more speakers, not all these 40 million, 40 million speak Catalan, but nevertheless, Catalan has more speakers than half of the official languages of the European nation, uh, the, of the European Union. We can talk about the reasons of why Catalan is still official at the European level during the discussion afterwards, if you're interested. The autonomous community of Catalonia covers a territory slightly bigger than Belgium and has a population of just under 8 million, more or less like the state of Washington. Our very well-known capital city, Barcelona, hosts 1.6 million people, but it is the core of a urban agglomeration of over 5 million. It's the third in the entire EU after Paris and Madrid, and the sixth in the continent if we include Moscow, London, and Istanbul. GDP is 2,070,000 000 million euros, which is about 34 euro per capita, which is more or less at the average at the EU. From the origins as a southern border of the Carolinian, Carolinian Empire, our history can be told as the history of a constant aspiration to institutionalize self-government that goes from the Catalan Empire in the Mediterranean in the late Middle Ages or the proto-democracy of our parliamentary early modernity or the participation of Catalans in the composition of the crown of the, in the composition crown of Spain during the colonial times, which explains our remnants in California. But conflict with Castile in this history has been a constant. And every time this conflict brought repression and military occupation, Catalans have retreated to more pragmatic arrangements based on devolution and subsidiarity, such as the early 20th century self-government charters. I don't mention that and you don't mention this just to justify our present claim to independence, but to explain that what happened in recent years is not a novelty, rather is just another chapter, hopefully the last in a long history of institutional mismatch. In a way, this has been the problem of Spain, the reason of its failure. Spain is a country that does not possess the kind of influence and power that it should, given its history. Spain suffers 
an imperial bound somehow, a frustration coming from not having the prestige it should. Yes, Spain is picturesque. Yes, food is good. Painters, dancers, and poets are good. But Spain is not the go-to power dealer, nor a moral, moral leader of the European Union. And its grip in Latin America has more to do with the past than with the future, with their language rather than with culture, with greed rather than with political leadership. Spain has never accomplished a process of unification and modernization like, like France or the UK managed in early modernity or the unification and integration that Germany and Italy accomplished in the right 19th century. All these countries, especially France and Italy, which are the closest in all respects, have erased most of their internal cultural, national, and linguistic diversity. In Spain, however, languages other than Spanish are alive, Catalan especially, but also Basque and Galician. And this is not because the Spanish state has not tried once and again to suppress them. Since the House of the Bourbon took over Spain in the early 18th century, the state has tried hard to become like France, a unified, uniform, unilingual state. But all the revolutions of modernity, from the Industrial Revolution to the liberal and nationalistic revolutions, and all the isms you can think of, socialism, anarchism, syndicalism, you name it, with the democratic consequences, they arrived first to Catalonia and the Basque country before they reached the core of the Spanish nation. Spain wasn't able to become a Castilian center France, France because they failed at subduing Catalonia. Spain has, was not strong enough to erase Catalonia and Catalonia was not strong enough to dominate Spain or to break away. Maybe the historical incentive was not right. Maybe the demographic imbalance was too great. Maybe the economic disparities were too stark. All in all, Spain had the political power and the territorial superiority. Had Catalonia had the economic dynamism and the connection with the rest of Europe and the Mediterranean. The prohibition of Catalan under Franco brutal to the point of banning Catalan first names was just the continuity of the story. When the totalitarian fascist tendencies of Europe reach Spain, they materialize as the modernization of the old dream of uniformation, and that meant defeating the Catalans and incorporating them in the Spanish destiny. It almost succeeded, but it wasn't enough. Once again, after 40 years of fractal dictatorships, Catalan voted for the democratic constitution massively. The constitution seemed to recognize the national character of the people of Catalonia and maybe out of guilt promised to protect the language. 20 years of democracy and normalization, however, proved that the promises were never fully developed. But unlike any other moment in Spain history, democracy did seem to have taken hold of the Spanish collective ethos. So the possibility of self-government had become a, a, a void promise, as it was clear that the minimum that Catalans were hoping to get was higher than the maximum that the Spanish electorate was willing to grant. The novelty was that making a last bit for further self-government seems safer from violence than any time in the past. After all, at that point, Catalans and Spaniards had become EU citizens. At the turn of the century, this mix of frustration with Spain, memory of old aspirations of freedom and national plenitude carried across generations and the hope of the possibilities of democracy was channeled by political parties to the reform of the Charter of Autonomy. In 2005, 90% of the Catalan parliament approved a new Charter of Autonomy. But this process 
I will spare you the details today, ended in frustration in 2010 when the Constitutional Court ruled that the reform was unconstitutional. This ruling marks the beginning of a massive pro-independence popular movement. It marks also the beginning of a time up until today in which Catalans are ruled with laws that don't have their consent. We are part of the Spanish order against our will. Year after year, millions of people took to the streets. I do not know of any other political movement in Europe that has managed to take to the streets in such numbers for such a long time. This robust grassroots pro-independence movement became a serious political challenge. Catalan political parties had to react and they incorporated independence in their electoral platforms. In heat side, it looks like it was probably mostly an opportunistic move. In the 2015 election, the main Catalan parties ran on a coalition with a platform to declare independence. They won the absolute majority of seats and 49% of the vote, 10 points ahead of the 39% of votes against independence. The few, a few months later, the Catalan parliament voted to have a binding referendum on independence. This is the moment that many people across the world became aware that Catalonia existed and that a secessionist movement was a serious event going on there. On October 1st, 2017, the referendum that had been declared illegal by the Constitutional Court was held amidst a futile attempt by the Spanish government to stop it by sending thousands of policemen. Despite the anti-riot brutality, the referendum went on. Thousands of ballots were confiscated by the police, but still 2.3 million people were formally counted, 90% in favor of independence. The number was too great to ignore. It became clear that the Spanish state, that if the Spanish state were to accept a referendum, the yes vote would have much more chances to win than the no. This was a real crisis. Catalonia must be retained by using other means. Democracy, consent was not available. The weeks after the referendum were messy to say the least. There had been calls from EU official, political brokers, embassies. There was pressure not to declare independence. But the people were on the streets and wanted it. And at the end of October, the Catalan parliament declared independence somehow. But no other action was taken to materialize independence. That same day, the Spanish Congress suspended Catalan autonomy and dissolved the Catalan government. Two of the civil leaders of the movement were already in prison. I decided to go into exile knowing that the Spanish state would arrest me for being part of the government that had organized a referendum. Half of the government followed suit and also went to exile. The other half was arrested and denied bail. And in the following months, pro-independence parties won again the election in parliament, in the Catalan parliament, but the nine political leaders were awaiting trials and they, sent, they were sentenced to nine to 13 years for sedition. Massive protests follow and hundreds of, protester, of protesters were prosecuted. The following months and years have been time of repression. Activists, demonstrators, politicians, all this happened under current Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez in power. Eventually, Pedro Sánchez got re-elected, supported by pro-independent parties looking for some sort of dialogue in a move that I have strongly criticized. There was some distension, in part due to the pandemic, but the judicial branch of the government, 
market pressing. Since 2017, at each election in the Catalan Parliament, there's been two pro-independence parties win the majority of seats and form government. But they have no clear strategy. Six years after the referendum and almost 20 years after the attempt to reform the Charter of Autonomy, the movement is divided, lost, without a clear leadership, and has wasted the confidence of the electorate. Polls show that many people don't believe Catalonia will be able to secede from Spain, even if they would want it, and people would still keep voting for independence parties. Let's move fast forward to today. The summer, Pedro Sánchez called a snap election, a snap Spanish election. Uh, the result is that he needs the support of pro-independence parties to become prime minister again. There is a lot of pressure because an unstable Spain is a big headache in Europe and because the alternative government could be a coalition with the conservatives and the far right. This has been ruled out now and we're about to see, it looks like, disagreement happening in the following years. It's still not all done, but it very much looks that this is going to happen. Mr. Sanchez's goal is pacification and his strategy consists in repressing first and rehabilitating later. But only the Catalan politicians that he can control. The premise is an old one. If Catalan leaders are tame, Catalan voters are tame. Spain has shown that you, you manage to keep repression at a tolerable level for international actors. You can work your way towards blocking secession by raising the bar of violence a little bit. It is a great lesson. Let me put it this way. We have two situations at the two ends of the Mediterranean that involve self-determination. In the East, we have war and terrorism. And in the West, we have the play of democratic forces with some illegitimate use of force, but never going beyond the threat or a few bruises and some years of jail. Nothing goes to a humanitarian crisis. The lessons of the Catalan bid for independence converge in one difficult truth to swallow. Democracy seems not to be enough when the state actor decides to block self-determination unless the seceding actor is willing to risk further violence. In this context, self-determination means the willingness to endure, provoke, or cause violence. When experts say that the world is hardening, that we are in a cycle of violence breeding violence, in part, the problem is that the alternative of those that could lead it, like the European Union, are not willing to, praise the, to pay the price of dismantling the incentives for violence. For us, <coughs> that means the recognition of political communities and the establishment of paths towards peaceful self-determination. What is the real obstacle to this kind of progress? Alan Buchanan famously said that we live in an age of secession. 100, thank you very much, thanks. <laughs> 131 sovereign states have been born since 1945 a threefold increase in 70 years. As Ryan Griffiths notes, if the rate of state birth were to continue at its current pace, there would be 260 countries in the world by 2050 and 354 by the end of the 21st century. Lake and Mahoney found that the average size of states increased steadily through the, 19, the 1800s and reached its zenith at the turn of the century at about 2 million square kilometers. However, in the last, it was after 1945 that the trend towards fragmentation truly began. 
states have proliferated and by 2004, the average site, size had fallen to 850 square kilometers, an average roughly similar to what it had been in 1850. Scholar is, uh, scholarly estimates put the share of civil wars driven by secessionism at about 50%. Roughly 52% of the civil wars between 1945 and 1999 involved secessions. Since the 1980s, at least half of all ongoing civil wars in any given year have been secessionists. Walters ar argues that secessionism is the chief source of violence in the world today. Griffith's own calculations so show that since 1945, there has been an average of 15 secessionist conflicts per year. But this also means that there are ways for peaceful secessions. The most common features for a peaceful process of secession are three. That the country where the conflict happens be a democracy that the country that aspires to independence has a clear administrative border, and that the self-determining nation, it was once a sovereign entity. Catalonia is a textbook case of these three things, especially since it belongs to the EU. In this sense, it is a case very similar to Scotland or Flanders. So, why is Catalonia not an independent state yet? How come? There are many potential answers, but I will summarize them to three. The first is the political nature of the European, nature, uh, European Union. The second relates to the Spanish incentives and history. And the third, is the Catalan political leadership. But before I argue about these three factors, let me address an additional hurdle that has to do with time and demography. It has been 300 years since Catalonia was a sovereign entity. Isn't that too much to claim statehood? Yes or no? In 300 years, many changes have happened. To me, the most important one happened in the 1950s and 60s under Franco's dictatorship. A massive migration from the South, rural Spanish provinces to Catalonia. The population doubled from 3 million to almost six. These migrants were Spanish speaking, and although most of them were working class, they came with the cultural project of the regime ready to incentivize the substitution of the Catalan language for the Spanish language. This was the main political preoccupation of the very weakened civil society of Catalonia at the time. A massive social response to incorporate newcomers into the Catalan culture ensured. With the highest echelons Echelons of Catalan society filled by Spaniards loyal to the regime or Catalan elites willing to please a dictator, this was a really difficult task. But the effort not to divide the inhabitants of Catalonia was reasonably successful and brought fruit, especially after 1980 when the autonomy was established. Furthermore, Sorry. As a result of this migration, the polls show that this has had a lasting political effect. If you look at the data, it turns out that if both of your parents or all of your grandparents were born in Spain, outside Catalonia, or outside the Catalan-speaking countries. Having this characteristic is the most is robust fact to predict that you oppose Catalan independence. Once you have one 
or two grandparents born in Catalonia, the prediction no longer works. This suggests an ethnic divide, as would be predictable anyway. What's interesting is that what we see, we see people crossing ethnic borders in one direction, but not in the other. A percentage of ethnic Spaniards are voting for independence, but it seldom happens the other way around. So Catalonia is still reproducing itself in its diversity, where Spain relies on ethnic loyalty. In any vote on independence, you will see that the reason why the result is not 90% of the population in favor of independence is because you will always have a steady 30% of the electorate that are either born in Spain or born of Spanish parents. There has been another wave of migration to Catalonia in the more recent years, a huge wave of migration that started at the turn of the century, this time from Africa and Latin America. This is, again, a major challenge that obviously has an impact in our politics and must be taken into account in any strategy of national survival, Catalan national survival. A serious discussion of this issue would require at least another lecture. Uh, so I will mostly leave it, uh, leave it here for today. Uh, we maybe want to discuss it at question time. The fact is that 300 years of subordination have created the conditions for assimilation to Spain, but the effort of the Catalan people to integrate newcomers into the culture and the fact that the aspiration of independence is still alive is evidence of a robust national soul. 300 years of waiting for levels of self-government that could be reached peacefully and without animosity against our Iberian neighbors, alternating aspiration of independence with other forms of confederal arrangement is a proof of patience, self-esteem, and of hope in the process of civilization in our corner in the world. Catalan society is complex and diverse, but 300 years later, we can still claim we are an engine of social reproduction. The Catalan nation exists. So let's now turn to the main question. Why Catalonia is not yet an independent country? First, let's talk about Europe. The EU is a very good organization that was set up to prevent the European state, st uh, states from starting again to killing each other. And it's very good at that. It is very good at creating an internal market that allows companies and workers to move freely and prosper. It is very good at regulating certain things at a grand scale because of the sheer power of aggregation of hundreds of millions of citizens and their pockets. And sure, it is very good at telling itself that it is the beacon of human rights and how culture God for us. But it is very bad at dealing with the problem of diversity of peoples. Almost every member state, and certainly every of the big ones, France, Germany, Italy, Poland, Spain, are the result of modern violence, of the result of treating their minorities as provincial second class. In the decades, decades that have passed since the discovery of Auschwitz by the Red Army, an inversion of the argument has been completed. <coughs> the promise not to repeat what the Nazis did is the foundational horizon of the post-war Europe ethos. But what is the thing that we must not repeat exactly? They aim at destroying, erasing, annihilating the Jewish minority, among other undesirables, in the name of the Aryan people. We have come to define this as nationalism, so that Europe is a project against nationalism. Now, every time a minority claims their rights, they call this nationalism, and thus the enemy against which these claims are made, the state, is the anti-nationalism side of the conflict. But they forget. 
They forget that Nazis hated nationalism because they were imperialists. As Anna Haren tells us, the Nazis had the genuine and never revoked content for the narrowness of nationalism, the provincialism of the nation state. And they repeated time and again that their movement, international in scope, like the Bolshevik movement, was more important to them than any state which could, would necessarily be bound to a specific territory. So it is not news to anyone that anti-Semitism was widespread in Europe before the Nazis attempted, attempted their final solution. But it's become part of our forgetting that every state in Europe is the outcome of a very violent form of imperialism, internal and external, both that aim at erasing all the national differences that were common before the revolutions in the late 18th century and through the 19th century. The Westphalian state transformed the right to sovereignty into a warrant for oppression of the minorities inside borders. The European Union has become the lock of this oblivion. When experts call it a club of state, they usually mean that integration into supra states institutions is difficult because the elite of these states resist to give up their power. But they forget that this is also true downwards. States protect each other. Thank you. When it comes to disregard the nations that subsist under their grip, this includes the Basques, Galician, Occitans, Bretons, Corsicans, Tyrolese, Flemish, and along, etc., of which Catalans are just the most numerous and visible. <coughs> but this is the EU problem. Self-determination is not a minor right, not in the sense of its application, but in the sense of its truth. Once the genie is out of the bottle, the only way to stop its effects is by means of repression. Europe only has a chance to become something relevant in the world if it becomes the example of both democracy and high standards of living. If the US is the experiment of prosperity plus freedom and China aims at being the experiment of prosperity under authoritarianism, Europe must incarnate the possibility of democracy and social wealth which includes equality and freedom at the same time. But to the extent that states protect the realities that were created through violence in the modern era, its democracy, its understanding of freedom and equality will only degrade and it will end up sliding with a sort of bureaucratic authoritarianism apparently soft where the values it claims to endorse are nothing but hypocritical excuses. And Catalonia has become the stress test of this problem. If it were a simple except, exception, a sui generis case, which in a sense it is, there might be a way for the EU to recognize its rights of self-determination while leaving the rest of the state-based arrangements untouched. But everybody suspects that this is not the case and not exactly due to a potential domino effect of independent states within Europe. Once the claim of Catalonia is heard, many other things must be changed in the way Europe sees itself, sees its past and its future. Why? This is why powerful states insist once and again, that this is a story of nationalists, us versus cosmopolitans, them. So Catalonia is not an independent state yet because Europe has not found the need to evolve towards its own truth. But if the world keeps turning violent and sectarian, if the influence of China keeps growing, if the remnants of the Russian empire keep spiraling into delusion, if the US turn its gates even more towards the Pacific, the only solution for Europe will be to reconcile its ambitions with its realism 
admittedly, my view of self-determination is that we should not wait for others to need our freedom, but that the change we want Europe to incarnate should come from our own impetus. If we, the Catalans, it's us who must force Europe to come to grips with this uncomfortable untold truth that the problem that led us to self-determination, self-destruction in World War II is not just that Nazis became too nationalistic. It is also that our idea of what a state is, it's predicated upon the assumption that peoples that are trapped inside the borders of those states cannot seriously believe that Europe is built on democracy and freedom if they are not treated as equals, with an equal right to sovereignty and equal access to the little engine of social reproduction of culture and identity that the state is today for everybody else. So much for the first reason. Let's turn to the second. The second reason is the nature of Spain itself. Ryan Griffin tells us Catalonia is a hard case because it has once it was once a sovereign state and because its current autonomous status is both the consequence and the cause of nationalist ambition. Yet, even in this case, we can see the strategic realities of the metropole. Madrid cannot recognize Catalan independence without seeing a precedent for other autonomies, such as Galicia and the Basque Country. The Spanish administrative architecture shapes Catalonia's possibilities. Since Spain has three possible dissident nations within it, granting self-determination to one implies accepting accepting it for the others. And that risk dissolution, as in Yugoslavia. So if Catalonia were to succeed, and if others follow suit, what would Spain be? What other identity would Spain have? Spain has devoted so much energy to subdue the peripheral nations that all its economic structure, all of its institutional structure, and all of its political culture is prepaid by this bond. Let me give you just a simple example. The most dynamic areas of Spain are located along the Mediterranean coast. This includes Catalonia, the Valencian country, and the Balearic Islands. 30% of the population lives there. But if you look at the very expensive high-speed train system, it looks like a wheel with Madrid at its center. These coastal territories are ringed with deficient highways and degraded trains. They are unconnected, unconnected, whereas other less populated, less dynamic areas are ringed with trains that nobody really uses, at least in the numbers that would justify the gargantuan investment in one of the most advanced train systems in the world. The reason for this absurdity is to stop the coastal territories where the Catalan, where Catalan is spoken to become the powerhouse of Spain. By doing this, they harm the whole Iberian Peninsula and hence they harm their, themselves. They harm Madrid and its surroundings as well. But this has an enormous cost for the entire population and and explains why Spain never really accomplishes the economic miracle that decades of European investment should have produced. This absurd centralizing obsession applies in all dimensions, taxation, judicial control, political leadership, cultural priorities, you name it. If Catalonia were to secede, Spain would stop wasting resources, both material and spiritual, <coughs> to deny reality, and could use its real forces for good. But the immediate aftermath of secession, the entire hierarchical political identity of Spain would suffer an overall. And those in charge today, those who benefit the most from the current arrangement would see their oversight power diminished, if not disappear. Now, as with Europe, the alternative 
is no solution. An increased need to repress Catalonia's aspiration is possibly only at the cost of further corruption, degrading Spanish democracy as is degrading everything good that has come of it. So once again, self-determination in Catalonia implies assuming this context and being willing to challenge the structure that sustains the current situation. It is not something that can be done frivolously. The outcome might even be not be independence. Everyone must accept the possibility of losing in a democratic system. But only if we're willing to challenge the deep disruption that comes from this wound, there is any hope for the Iberian Peninsula and as a consequence for Europe. And now let me turn to the third and most important reason why we're not yet independent. And with that, I will conclude. Going a little bit over time. The third, and I think most important reason why we're not independent, it's leadership. I will be somewhat brief on this because this mostly concerns us Catalans. It is our job to become aware of this problem and find remedies because self-determination is above all the task of those who identify with the self that aims at determination. As Michael Walzer eloquently tells us, the members of a political community, community must seek their own freedom just as the individual must cultivate his own virtue. They cannot be set free as he cannot be made virtuous by external force. What Catalan leaders did during the fall of 2017, especially after the day of the referendum, is a textbook case of what not to do if you want to gain independence. At the most basic level, the rule to follow in this situation is in the moment of truth, either go all in or you don't go at all. But they did neither. After October 1st, they hesitated and procrastinated for four weeks. I attended some meeting, meetings, but that were, they was not part of the inner circle of decision. I had become a minister just weeks before the referendum when some members of the government had resigned. It was my first time in professional politics and every time I saw something that felt wrong, my first in instinct was to doubt myself. I thought I didn't understand. And the truth is that there was nothing, there was nothing to understand because there was nothing substantial being done. By making up their minds as events unfolded, they were very vulnerable to all kinds of pressure from the international community, from businesses, factic powers, and political agents in Catalonia and Spain that failed to lose their advantage from the status quo. They were making their minds as events unfolded because up to that point, they had not believed that the opportunity for independence would really arise. Their vulnerability in the face of pressure also meant that they had not anticipated the possibility of those pressures and had not prepared with conviction to supersede them. They had not reflected on what to do next. The most benign explanation for this failure is that they had not considered the scenario that the referendum would really work. I guess they either expected that Spain, Spain would stop it before it happened or that the Catalan people would not turn out in such numbers and force, especially after thousands of policemen were deployed to threaten it. But the opposite happened. The Spanish aggression made people long for freedom, prompt them to defend their right to vote because they understood at a gut level, if you wish, that if you collectively back down for fear of police repression, then your life, both politically and personally, is defined by cowardice and humiliation. For a leader to start the process of self-determination, if you're not willing to go through it with it at the end, you have not prepared yourself mentally and strategically 
to handle the huge, pre huge pressures that such process will necessarily entail. As a leader, this is a major responsibility because once you put yourself, once you put self-determination in the middle of the Catalan public debate, it is impossible to use it for anything else than for its own purpose. It is the issue at the core of every other political debate, and it has been so for generations. It does not matter if in this context, Catalans were more or less explicitly for independence. The reality is that every moment in the modern era, in every context, the toxic relationship with Spain determines everyone's position be it in favor of assimilation or in favor of resistance. A decade of demonstrations, elections, debates from the largest public gatherings in our history to the tiniest popular assembly in the most humble villages. Once you've made self-determination explicit as a project, no one can deal with the consequences as if they were simply using it to bargain with. In hindsight, it looks as if they hoped that the hinting at self-determination would be strong enough to get a good bargaining position with the always reluctant Spanish state for a better negotiation on self-government, but not strong enough to really challenge the status quo and lose control of the situation. In good or bad faith, the leaders implicitly saw their jobs as stabilizing the secular conflict between Spain and Catalonia. They entered politics, they had entered politics in a context in which their value could be measured by their ability to defend Catalans from the uniformization, the uniformizing forces of the state. Three decades before the referendum, their job at stopping state was not that effective, and the popular response in demand of freedom was too great for them to tame it. This is the tragedy. They were ready for weaker, more cynical times, not for stronger, hopeful ones. At the end of the, way, the day, however, they feared the Spanish response more than they feared the exigency of the Catalan electorate. And in a way, with good reasons, the six years that have passed since have shown that the Catalan electorate is trapped. It is a captive audience, so to speak. And the Spanish electorate system makes it very difficult for new forces to emerge. So the Catalan pro-independence electorate faces a dire choice between voting for our own failing leaders or voting for those that deny the very existence of the Catalan nation. So no wonder we're seeing more and more people disengage from politics. There is one further reason for their mistakes. Recall that independence was declared, but not made effective. At the time, the government was a coalition of two parties, a center-right and a center-left, that over decades, the smaller party had been growing steadily with the aspiration of independence. For the first time since the end of the Franco dictatorship, the smaller center-left party seemed to be able to overtake the center-right one. So these two people, these two parties were playing a chicken game. They both thought that the path towards the referendum would eventually reveal the weakness of the other. So they both thought that they had something to gain from the threat of the referendum vis-a-vis -vis of Spain and something to gain from its failure vis-a-vis -vis of the immediate competitor. All in all, what they never believed was that independence was in the making, at least not for the moment. And they played with this grand idea just as tools of maneuvering their daily political discourse, this dispute. But the referendum had unleashed the genie that could not be put back in the bottle. They did not know what to do. Who was going to tell the people that the, com that the conviction and courage that they had displayed on October 1st, the day of the referendum, did not have any purchasing power because their readers had not prepared anything. Nobody wanted to be the bad guy. So they pushed one another to the precipice. And at the last minute, none wanting to be the traitor, the situation pushed the president to declare independence symbolically and nothing else. Two main explanations are given for these mistakes. 
One is has to do with violence. But after all, if we're looking at what happened, it was police brutality, not military intervention. 20,000 policemen were sent to stop the referendum and nobody died. This shows restraint. Agrandize, uh, when the leadership devotes the energies to aggrandizing the threat of violence to excuse surrendering, this is toxic because it turns repression into the main political idea of the polity. It makes people doubt themselves and it tells them that they are weak and hopeless. It, this is psychological poison. The second explanation was for not doing what had to be done, was that popular support was not strong enough. The argument claims if the, the people had turned out in higher numbers to the referendum, they would have done it. In other words, they give, if Spain had given permission, instead of sending the police, of the people had made their job easier, they would have done it. An obvious answer to this is that they believe that, if they believe that since the beginning, then, their actions show that they should have never brought the situation to the moment of all or nothing, because it was obvious that the result would be nothing. So increasing fear of, uh, fear of violence and telling people that they are not enough instead of taking responsibility for your own failures is just plain wrong and stupid because it weakens your own constituency for the future. The job of politicians is to work with whatever they had and what they had at the moment was enough to go through it. We could have lost, sure, but when the bully is taunting you, it is when you have to show your strength, not your weaknesses. When the international community is looking down on you, it's when you have to show that you rather have their hatred or their disdain for your uncompromised commitment to your freedom than their condolences afterward for the loss of your collective existence. If they believe none of this was possible, even up until the last minute, they should have not brought the country to the brink of political dissolution. Now, they have made it much more difficult to turn the desire for independence and freedom into an articulate political movement because you need some degree of trust and self-esteem to succeed. But that is our job. And we have no other option but to do it or else we face extinction. Sometimes from the depths of your failures, you find the strength for your endurance. I hope that in another time, not too far away, when I come to California and people ask me where I am from, I can just tell them I am a Catalan and they will know that I am free. Thank you very much. We'll sit here. Hi, um, so thank you so much, uh, Clara, for uh, you know such a, a an illuminating uh, talk. Um, it's covered a lot of ground, and I'm sure that there will be some questions coming from this audience and possibly also from those who are uh, connecting remotely. So, any questions? Oh, a very interesting talk. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I'm Scottish. I was born in St Andrews. Mm. And a lot of parallels, obviously, um, with Scotland and what you've been talking about. And I wonder um, two things. One, how you think Scotland would fare as an independent nation. And two, I fear that they have a problem with leadership also in Scotland. <laughs> and do you think this is perhaps a general problem for countries that wish to secede. Given Brexit also. You stole my question. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I don't think it's my job to uh, give lessons about Scottish uh, politics. Uh, so I'll be very brief. I think that, um, that, well, I mean, I think that the kind of problems that, uh, why is Scotland not an independent country yet? The three, uh, the, the three or four uh, reasons why that is, it is uh, clearly different than in Spain. And I'm not sure, I mean, I wouldn't dare to add 
leadership, uh, but uh, that may be, it may be possible. Of course, it's obvious that they had had, uh, the, you know, that they had be, a very uh, visible and apparently very competent leader that resigned. And to what extent she resigned because she didn't feel up to the task. But in a way that also shows leadership, I would say. So I'll leave it here. <laughs> Um, well, people uh, think of the questions. Um, I have one um, which relates to your statement that the EU uh, was not willing, maybe still it's not willing to dismantle the incentives for violence. Um, since this is now something that's no longer in doubt, we have had plenty of proof of, of, of this. Um, how do you envision then the um, forward movement of the independence uh, push in Catalonia uh, under these conditions, because the EU clearly uh, has sent the statement or the, uh, you know, has clarified their position that it's willing to allow the, the states to repress secessionist movements. Um, in October of 2017, this was still up for grabs. It was not known. Now it is a known entity. Yeah. Well, but my claim is that the violence that was used uh, was uh, low intensity. Uh, so, um, in a way, the claim is we had already seen what the violence that uh, Spain could uh, display. The arguments that had been used to uh, justify not going through had to do with the claim that there could have been an escalation on the part of Spain. Uh, I mean, these are, these are all hypotheticals, uh, but we've seen what Spain could deploy. We've seen what they could do. Uh, and what uh, I feel is that the capacity to endure that sort of uh, aggression on the part of Spain uh, was there. So uh, it's not uh, it's not a matter of um, needing a lot more than that what what was available uh, in October uh, seventeen. So I, my impression is that uh, I mean it's uh, uh, at this point it's very difficult to think of scenarios in which a new opportunity may arise. Uh, but whatever they are, if they ever arise, uh, they will probably look uh, very similar. What makes you think that, that Spain deployed all of the violence that it was ready to deploy since there was no resistance on the part of the Catalan people? What do you mean there was no resistance? There was no resistance because- People voted. No, that was the resistance. No, I mean after the uh, declaration, so few weeks later, um, you know, the government fled. Uh, ah, okay, not the people, the politicians. <laughs> That's had, different. Had they stayed and had there been uh, resistance on the part of the people, what makes you think that Spain's violence was would have been no larger, no bigger, and no more intense than what was deployed on October 1st? Would have been similar. I mean, that, that we can measure, you know, how many policemen they have, what tools do they have, they, what is their ability to be at different places at the same time. So basically, the, the thing is that if that is the argument, if we think that we cannot face that, then the consequences is let's give up, except that we cannot be independent, which is, you know, something, it, it's, a, it's a discussion that I'm happy to have, but then we should have it as an open discussion. 